Eretz Yisrael. That is the subject to talk about at this time. So let me share with you a few ideas by way of um, celebrating, I suppose, the completion of your of your admirable program in terms of our feeling about Jews, loving other Jews, Jewish people, loving the Jewish people as a whole. The starting point, of course, is that it is more than a mitzvah, I would say, to love other Jews. Now, we know some Jews are harder to love than others. That's true. I'm afraid that doesn't, uh, that doesn't diminish the obligation. Perhaps it gives even more merit for this effort. Let me try to give you an insight into something perhaps a little unusual, but more thought-provoking maybe than simply than simply chizuk um, in the idea itself. Something to think about. I would like to suggest that relating to the Jewish people, love of the Jewish people, has two dimensions. There's loving Jews and seeking their benefit. That we know. But I think there's something about the Jewish people as a whole that should occupy another place in our minds. In other words, I think there's something about a community, the togetherness of community that transcends individuals that I think we should think about as well. Let me put this in contemporary terms, if I may. We're living through a COVID crisis, an unusual situation, lockdowns, isolation. That's a remarkable opportunity to think about individuals, isolation, what that does to us, the space we're given to think on our own, and missing community, minyanim for a long period of time, getting together in many ways, still going through that. What, what, what thoughts are occasioned by this situation? Let me, let me go through, mention, two Gemaras that I think are, are seldom compared, but I think they have a very important relevance to each other. Let's talk about the obligation to save oneself as opposed to saving others. And let's see how that works out when we think about it on an individual level and on a community level. On an individual level, I'm thinking of a famous Gemara, which everyone I'm sure is familiar with, Gemara Baba Metzia. Gemara says that if two people are walking in the desert, one of them has a bottle of water, and there's only enough water in the bottle to get that person back to civilization, or if you share the water with your friend, neither one gets back. In other words, there's only enough water to get you back home. But the cost of that will be letting your friend die. If, however, you share the water with your friend, you both live another day, but neither one gets home. Not enough water to get you back to civilization and long-term survival. As you know, there's an argument in the Gemara between Ben Petura and Rabbi Akiva, two different sides, logic of the question. And we rule according to Rabbi Akiva's opinion, that is the one who has the water drinks it. Leave your friend to die. You drink the water, Chayecha Kodmin, your obligation to save yourself precedes that of saving your friend, and therefore you drink the water. Most opinions, this is not directly our subject, but most opinions are that that's, a, that that's an obligation. There are opinions, like the Orachayim, amazingly, who points out that it's a permission. In other words, you may choose to save your friend's life over your own. You may choose yours, or you could choose your friend's. Most postkim who talk about this seem to feel it's not a permissibility to drink the water, it's a downright obligation. Chayecha Kodmin is not a heter, it's a chiyuf. In other words, you're obliged to save your life. As a complete side point, just to give you something to think about after this talk, what would happen if no one owns the water? Chazanish discusses this. What would happen if you arrive there with a helicopter, you've got a bottle of water, two people in the desert, you could give it to one, say flip a coin, give it to one, or and he will survive, or you could split it between two who will live a little longer and then they'll both die. In other words, would we handle this the same way or not? I think the question really boils down to this. Why does the Gemara say, why does Rabbi Akiva say that the one who has the water drinks it? Is it because it's better to save one life or is it because it's his water? You see, the test case would be if it's not his water. A third party arrives with a bottle of water. You land there in your helicopter. It's neither one's water. Would we then default to Ben Petura since no one owns the water? Or is the value of saving one life rather than two short-term deaths, does that transcend uh, in this case as well. Okay, some homework, something interesting, and I hope it keeps you up all night thinking. You look it up in the Chazanish, it talks about it in more than one place. But let's go back to the basic, the basic, the basic din. The basic din is that the one who has the water drinks it, and you save your life. That's well known. Your life comes first. You have a concentric layers, a hierarchy 
of concentric levels of life-saving, and you come first. There's another Gemara in the Dorim, Daf Pei. There the Gemara talks about a water supply to a city, not to an individual. Remarkably parallel in some ways. But there we're talking about community, not individual. The other Gemara says that if two cities are on a water course, let's say there's a well or which, with water flowing from the well into a stream or a river, some sort of water supply, which is, which is uh, located in one of the towns, and then flows down to a downstream town. Now, what happens if there's limited water in the stream? The other Gemara talks about which priorities, giving water, water for drinking, water for the animals, various types of priority the Gemara goes through. And then it gets to this one. What if there's only enough water in the river? That if the upstream people drink only, there'll be enough water for the downstream people to drink. But if the upstream people drink and do their laundry, talking about washing clothing, there'll be no water at all for the downstream people to drink. Now let's get this clear. We're talking here about drinking water as opposed to laundry water, which means if the people upstream constrain themselves to drink only, their compatriots downstream will have water to drink. If, however, the people upstream drink and do their laundry, they wash their clothing, there'll be no water at all for the downstream people to drink. What's the obligation of Jews in the upstream town? Now, the majority opinion is that they drink only and they leave enough water for the downstream friends. Rabbi Yossi comes along, and it's a very weighty opinion in Halacha. It's brought in subsequent sources. And he says that the upstream people drink and wash. They drink and do their laundry, even though the downstream people have no water to drink at all. Now, this is remarkable. Now, it's true there's a lot of room to move in this Gemara, without now going into the details, on both ends. There are some opinions that the people downstream without water will not die of thirst, only they will have to make an extreme effort to find water, that's one opinion. Other opinions are that, in fact, it's a life and death question for them. The upstream people, there are also two opinions about that, a range of opinions. One set of opinions is that they do their laundry because it's a life and death question for them. If they don't do their washing, there'll be an outbreak of hygiene-related epidemic among them, which is also a life and death question. Admittedly, not death tomorrow, but perhaps death the next day or the next week. That's also life and death, and they may consider that. Other opinions are that the laundry is only a question of convenience and comfort. So there's a lot of there's a lot of leeway in how you learn this Gemara. But with cutting through all of that, we still see a remarkable thing. We see that there's, from one perspective at least, and this may even be an extreme perspective if, if you go through the factors I just mentioned, the people upstream are allowed to wash as well as drink, even though downstream people have no water to drink. Now that's remarkable. But I think the question to ask here is, how would that apply to an individual? Is it conceivable we'd think that way with an individual? Let's go back to the desert. Two people walking through the desert. One of them has a bottle of water. And there's only enough water, let's assume. Let's, let's take a new case. Let's assume there's enough water to get both of you home. Just enough to get both of you home. But just before sharing the water with his friend, the man with the water turns to his friend and he says, <coughs> says, you know, I really need to wash my shirt. His friend says to him, but how can you do that? I'm going to die. He says, well, there's Gemara in the Dorim. It says that laundry comes before, my laundry comes before your life. Is that conceivable? It's unthinkable. The Gemara doesn't, doesn't address the question at all. And the reason is that when it comes to an individual and when it comes to a community, we think differently. When it comes to an individual, there's no question about your laundry. That, but that, be, could, that could well be a life and death question for a community. I think you see this in Gittin as well. When the Gemara talks about impoverishing a community to ransom captives back. We won't pay exorbitant prices to ransom captives back under certain circumstances for fear of impoverishing a community. That's a real thing. They bring in the name of the Rogachova, in classic, classic, typical fashion for him. He said that the reason we don't say Becholma or Dechem in the second paragraph of Shema, how do, what do we say in Shema? We say Bechol Lavshcha Becholma or in the first paragraph when we speak to the individual. You have to love Hashem with all your heart, all your, all your soul, and all your money, your life and your money. In the second paragraph, we don't mention money when we're speaking in the plural to a community. Said the Rogachova, for you as an individual, you have to give everything for Hashem. But you give all your money, which is impoverishing a community and has consequences for others in the community. No, not so fast. So I think you see this very clearly. A community has needs. In COVID, in the COVID situation, we're talking about locking down individuals to save them and impoverishing a community. That's very real. 
There's no question that the isolation and lockdown was necessary in the beginning. But there comes a point in time when impoverishing a community, costing jobs, and all sorts of effects on a community are very real. Okay, it's a delicate balance. How you release that pressure, risk individuals for the sake of community, that's a very thorny problem. But the two sides of the problem are real. Let me tell you an incident <clears throat> that I remember hearing from Rav Zilberstein. Here's what happened. In the life of Rav Yashiv, Rav Zilberstein, his son-in-law, was faced with the following question, which he put to Rav Yashiv. There was a family living in a certain, a couple, young couple living in a certain European city, found themselves unable to have children for a long time, and eventually found themselves at a very good fertility unit at a Tel Aviv hospital, and they had a child. Happened to be exceptionally wealthy young couple, and in his joy at having a child, the new father made a massive donation to the hospital, but stipulating that his money should go to helping other people have children. After all, that's how he wanted to express his gratitude. Well, the director of the hospital, you know, Israelis sometimes have their own opinions. And the hospital director said to the, said to the fellow, I'm not, that's immoral of you. It is immoral of you to pay money to help people have children when I've got dying people who need to be saved. I've got people who need chemotherapy that's expensive and surgery. You have no right to help people have children when I've got dying people who need to be saved. It's a straight question of Pikuach Nefesh. So the man said, I'm not giving my money. Well, they ended up at, at Rav Yashiv. What is the right thing to do? Rav Yashiv said, this man has a full right to give his money to help the fertility uh, program. So the hospital director said, Rabbi, don't you know Jewish law? Pikuach Nefesh is saving lives. How can you say that? And listen to what Rav Yashiv said, and I heard this from Azil Bishlein myself. He said, a country needs a normal spread of facilities. When you fund only uh, emergencies, military and emergency facilities, people get an embattled mentality. That affects morale. That's a life and death question. Now, you need very broad shoulders to call those shots for a community. But that's what he said. So I think we see again, without going into the nitty gritty technical halachics question on, on, the, on that particular occasion. But I think you see from here again another view of the same question. Community has a reality. And we need to think uh, uh, on that level as well. You know, the Arizal says something quite amazing. Quite amazing. He says that the last thought you should have before you dove in Shemone Esrei, you're about to approach Hashem, you're taking three steps forward, you're about to engage with Hashem. What is the last thought that should cross your mind before you think and focus on your love and closeness with Hashem? He says, Avas Yisrael. Isn't that amazing? You're about to dress God, speak to Hashem. The obvious thought is how much you love Hashem. No, the last thought you take with you as you move into that relationship, how much you love other Jews. There are many layers to this Kabbalistically as well, of course. But a simple one is this. What sort of child are you of a parent if you're not concerned about your siblings? A child approaches a parent completely oblivious of the needs of his siblings, which are causing pain to the parent. You don't understand the parent-child relationship if you do that. And therefore, as you move into your private relationship with Hashem, your private relationship, Shimon Esra, your private communication, you take with you your love of other Jews. And that love of other Jews builds a reality that is transcendent. When it comes to counting the Omer, what do we do? We count to a point which transcends individual counting. The last day of the Omer, the Torah says, Tisbru Chamishim Yom, we don't count the 50th day. We do not count the 50th day. The point is we get to something beyond counting. The past amount to something that is beyond the parts. When you play musical musical notes, each note is ridiculously trivial. Each note is a plink or a plonk or a plonk or a plink. But when you put the plinks and plonks together, you get something called music, which transcends the notes by far, and yet is built only through the notes. That transcendent reality, which is a poem or a painting or a story or the history of the Jewish people, or any musical experience, is made by attention to the details. To each, if you get one note wrong, you haven't played the music correctly. But the experience is the music which transcends the notes. Your life should be like that. Your life is a series of events, ideas in Torah, sugis in Torah mastered, which should amount to something which transcends, which gives you a knowledge that transcends the logical. There should be assembly of parts. A marriage should be like that. A marriage should be a series of events over years, that amounts to a love which transcends the parts. A marriage is not just a long string of kind deeds and isolated incidents. If it is, there's something desperately wrong. That cannot be called a love. A deep love between two people is something that transcends the individuals and the details to mesh into something that is larger than the sum of the parts. 
So the thought I'd like to leave you with is a broad vision of what it means, what Avos Yisrael means. It isn't only loving your neighbor and doing something good for that particular neighbor. Of course that's essential. But there's something broader. When you relate to a neighbor correctly, when you relate to a neighborhood correctly, when you relate to something broader than the individuals around you, you build something that is transcendent. And that transcendent unity begins to manifest the oneness of Hashem. The divine oneness is manifest by parts. Hashem is one, means an assembly of all the parts. And the only avenue of access we have to Hashem is to assemble the parts correctly. I think the thought to take away is that as we move through this difficult time of year, we should be playing music. One type of music, forbidden in the three weeks. But another type of music, absolutely an obligation. To put together the notes of individual incidents in a lifetime, individual acts of kindness, individual attention to individuals and individual needs, and yet with an ear to a much broader symphony that is evolving. Best wishes and thank you.